How the Golden State Killer was caught. Throughout the 1970s and 1980s, Californians lived in fear as they were the prey of a serial killer. Strangely, this was not unusual. This period was regarded as the golden age of serial killers, as there were many of them prowling the United States at the time. However, this killer was particularly brutal. In addition to murdering his victims, he also raped, robbed, tormented, and stalked them. The perpetrator who became known as the Golden State Killer was finally linked to horrific attacks in seven California counties and to 60 victims from throughout the state. He hunted his human prey between 1976 and 1986, at the very least. Between June 1976 and July 1979, for instance, one of his favorite targets were the middle-class residences in Sacramento County. He would target a property, then sneak inside the invariably single-story home prior to the assault, studying the layout, dimming porch lights, locating any weapons, and removing their rounds, and even stashing ropes throughout the house for later use. Even after the physical assault, he often taunted his victims by calling them. He used spotlights to blind women and threatened to murder them if they resisted. He would blind parents or spouses, balance plates on their heads, and threaten to begin severing fingers if the dishes fell. He targeted everyone, from adolescents and juveniles to adults and couples. Initially, he left his victims alive. Then, in 1978, he shot and murdered Katie and Brian Maggiore as they walked their dog, followed by Robert Offerman and his girlfriend Deborah Alexandria Manning. After these murders, he made certain to murder his intended victims. The numbers continued to rise, but he remained in the shadows. Welcome to Bad Things. This is the story of how a 44-year-old cold case was solved and a brutal serial killer was put behind bars. When a cold case was finally closed in early 2020, it offered many people hope. Hope that no matter how long ago a crime was committed, there is still a possibility for justice. When Joseph D'Angelo was finally apprehended, decades of terror ended. Due to the magnitude of D'Angelo's crimes, his hearing was conducted in a university's ballroom to accommodate the multitude of victims and victims' relatives who wished to attend. So, how did he manage to evade capture for four decades? Numerous factors were at play. Firstly, the attacks happened hundreds of miles apart, prompting authorities to investigate family members and jilted lovers, not knowing that all the cases were related. Once it was found that several of these incidents occurred in clusters, it was first thought that several serial killers or rapists were responsible. Even their pseudonyms were distinct. East Area Rapist, Visalia Ransacker, and Original Night Stalker. In the 1970s, DNA technology was not as advanced as it is now. In 1986, when Janelle Cruz was killed, her killer's DNA was obtained from the crime scene. However, it took more than a decade before that DNA was linked with DNA obtained from other crime scenes, including the murders of Keith and Patty Harrington. Then it matched DNA from two rape cases in Contra Costa County from the late 1970s. As a result, a new task force was established to facilitate information sharing across the various jurisdictions. His pattern remained consistent for some time. For years, the unnamed attacker would break into a residence every few weeks, raping and, in later instances, murdering his victims. In 1981, however, it stopped. However, after a five-year pause, there was one more murder. In May of 1986, the Cruz family was on vacation. Janelle Cruz, however, had recently landed a job at a neighborhood pizzeria and remained at home to work. One evening, she entertained a guest who subsequently reported hearing unusual sounds outside before he departed. They had assumed it was a cat. The next day, the real estate agent showing the property discovered Cruz's corpse. She had been raped and beaten to death with a missing pipe wrench from the residence. Although it took years before she was formally connected to the dozens of other atrocities committed in California, her mother and her sister were among the first to be notified when D'Angelo was arrested. Who was Joseph James D'Angelo Jr.? In 1973, 
the Vietnam War veteran joined the Exeter Police Force. He joined the police force in May, was married in November, and while he was investigating crimes in Exeter, a staggering 85 burglaries occurred in the adjacent city of Visalia. In 1976, after he transferred to another department outside of Sacramento, a serial rapist began cruising the Sacramento suburbs. D'Angelo's police training undoubtedly aided his efforts to evade discovery. He continued to patrol and investigate with officers searching for him until 1979, when theft charges ended his police career. During the process of being dismissed, D'Angelo stalked the home of the police chief and threatened to murder him. This is also when he began killing. So why did he stop in 1986? D'Angelo said he murdered on the orders of an inner voice called Jerry. When Jerry vanished in 1986, he stopped killing. He remained in the area, took a job at a Save Mart distribution center, raised his children, and frightened his neighbors with his anger issues. Neighbors and colleagues, some of whom had known him for decades, thought he was odd but never guessed that he was a serial killer. According to D'Angelo's brother-in-law, D'Angelo would casually mention the East Area rapist around the time of the first crimes. According to his neighbors, he routinely participated in loud, obscene outbursts. Because of their loud dog, a neighbor's family got a phone message from D'Angelo, threatening to deliver a load of death. The Woman Who Lit the Fire the case of California's serial rapist and murderer stayed in 40 boxes for years. Michelle McNamara, a journalist, ensured that no one forget these gruesome crimes. McNamara's interest in real crime was sparked by the brutal death of a young woman she knew from church when she was just 14 years old. Her murderer was never apprehended, a reality of life McNamara learned she could not tolerate. Her husband, the comedian and actor Peyton Oswalt, encouraged her to launch a true crime blog, which opened the door to her career as a crime writer and led her to the decades-old unresolved case in California. In addition to piecing together components that had been disregarded for years and pulling all kinds of strings that others in more formal positions could not, she unearthed a treasure trove of files that had not been examined in years. In 2016, she was certain that the killer's identity was concealed inside the 40 boxes of papers and evidence. Sadly, McNamara did not live to witness the apprehension of the person she had dubbed the Golden State Killer. Under the pressure of solving the case and authoring a book about it, she pushed herself to exhaustion, then unintentionally overdosed on a cocktail of medicines that included Xanax. She passed away on April 21, 2016. When the arrest of the Golden State Killer was announced, individuals who had read Michelle McNamara's book and followed her efforts to identify the man behind the name, posthumously congratulated her. McNamara, so the story goes, strongly believed that DNA would identify the murderer. And it did. You cannot hide from DNA. Prior to the 2001 formal connection between the original Night Stalker and the East Area Rapist, several law enforcement authorities, primarily from the Sacramento County Sheriff's Department, attempted to link the Galetta murders as well. The similarities were mostly due to operational similarities. One of the original Night Stalker double killings happened in Ventura, 40 miles southeast of Galetta, while the other murders occurred in Orange County, 90 miles southeast. Several rapes thought to have been perpetrated by the East Area Rapist in Contra Costa County in 2001 were connected by DNA to the killings of Smith, Harrington, Withen, and Cruz. A decade later, DNA evidence suggested that the Domingo Sanchez killings were also the work of the East Area Rapist, who was now known as the Golden State Killer. On June 15, 2016, the FBI revealed further information on the crimes, including fresh composite drawings and facts about the crimes. A reward of $50,000 was also offered. The initiative included a nationwide database to aid in the investigation of crimes by law enforcement and to manage tips and information. 
Eventually, using genetic genealogy searches on JetMatch, detectives uncover distant relatives of D'Angelo, including family members linked to his great-great-great-great-grandfather from the 1800s. Using this information, investigators constructed around 25 distinct family trees. The tree that finally connected to D'Angelo comprised around 1,000 individuals. Over the course of many months, detectives utilized additional indicators like as age, gender, and place of residence to eliminate people populating these trees, until just D'Angelo remained. On April 18th, a DNA sample was obtained covertly from the door handle of D'Angelo's vehicle, and a second sample was obtained from a tissue discovered in his rubbish can. Both were correlated with Golden State Killer-related crime samples. On April 24, 2018, officers of the Sacramento County Sheriff detained D'Angelo. Eight charges of first-degree murder with aggravating circumstances were filed against him. The District Attorney's Office of Santa Barbara County charged D'Angelo with four more charges of first-degree murder on May 10. In exchange for avoiding the death penalty, D'Angelo pled guilty on June 29 to 13 charges of first-degree murder and exceptional circumstances, including murders committed during burglaries and rapes, and 13 counts of kidnapping. On August 21, 2020, D'Angelo was sentenced to multiple consecutive life terms without parole. D'Angelo apologized briefly after days of hearing pre-sentencing victim impact testimonies, saying, I've listened to all your statements, each one of them. And I'm truly sorry to everyone I've heard. Thank you for watching Bad Things. Hit the subscribe button, like button, and notification bell, and share our channel for our up-and-coming true crime videos.